So, Professor Vandenacker, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to sit down and uh, consider some uh, 21st century questions about online education. Uh, I suppose that's a good place to start. Um, give us a sort of orient us about what you have been doing professionally in terms of online education. Okay, first, thanks for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. So I got my degree in English in the late 1980s and then I went to graduate school and so the professions changed a lot and so I went and got a graduate certificate in instructional technology for educators because I wanted to see what all the buzz was about with online education and with integrating technology into education and so I have now taught some classes that are hybrid where much of the class is in person but some of the components are online and then I've taught some wholly online courses as well. So I think it would be uh, interesting to <clears throat> hear uh, what your, in terms of your experience, uh, educating online versus in a classroom setting, uh, you know, the traditional forms of education versus the 21st century forms of, ed of education. Um, you know, what, what's the, what's that experience like for you? One thing I love about teaching online is if it's done well, and that's something I should talk about a little bit, is that it really can level the playing field for a lot of students. There are a lot of students in a face-to-face -face classroom who feel very comfortable speaking, but then there are a lot who uh, have so much to say but they don't really feel comfortable articulating their thoughts, they don't feel they can do that on the fly. And so the online experience gives people time to really compose their thoughts and put their thoughts out there. So I think you do get a much richer perspective from every student in the class and each student can take a larger role in the, in the class experience. Um, I do think a lot's lost. Um, there's a, I do love face-to-face -face interaction as well. So for the students who thrive in that, I think the online experience can feel kind of depersonalizing and limiting to them. Uh -huh. But what I really learned is that I think when education started to use technology, a lot of people were just taking their face-to-face -face materials and scanning them and kind of chucking them online. So they were losing um, what worked in the delivery method of face-to-face -face without leveraging what online education can do. So I really think there are two very different ways of teaching and that to do the online well you have to do, um, you have to use discussion differently than you do in face-to-face. -face. You have to really well, not have to, but you should. Why wouldn't you use the web and bring in a lot of resources that multimedia resources that are harder to bring in in face-to-face and to use it as ways to help people connect with each other. So, and to give projects that are very self-directed because you do have to be self-motivated if you're in an online class. Right. So I really did learn a lot about how to leverage the online experience differently than the face-to-face -face experience. Uh, we live in a hyper-connected world that has shifted our understanding, access, and experience of knowledge. Uh, what appeals most to you about this reality? And there's a second question connected to that, which is, what is most repellent to you about this reality? Well, for me, it's the same answer. Um, I love the interconnectivity because uh, when you and I were students, it was actually, I think, somewhat difficult to find knowledge. If we were doing a research paper or something, we'd have to go to the library, we'd have to go through the card catalog, we'd have to go through those periodical index things to find things in journals. And um, if our library didn't subscribe to it, it took a long time to get the material to come in. And so with the interconnectivity, I just find it really miraculous actually that people have so much information literally right at their fingertips if they know how to find it mm -hmm. they can get it 
and I love that. Um, I love that I can interact with people in California, in China, wherever, around the world, mm -hmm. like that. It's so much easier. But what I don't like is that um, I increasingly see people not so skilled anymore in being face-to-face, -face, not comfortable in being face-to-face. -face. Even in a face-to-face -face class, it's very challenging to keep the people sometimes there and to say, I have to say to them sometimes, text later, listen now. Uh-huh. <laughs> So I think that people are so used to that, um, always being connected, that they even have trouble focusing sometimes on what's going on in the class because they're so almost anxious about what they might be missing when they're not online, right? Or not connected to those other folks. Right. Um, now, uh, we all have a place that, uh, you know, our sort of our come from place. So I asked this question in that spirit. Um, your areas of expertise include rhetoric and composition theory, 20th century American poetry, creative writing, and documentary film. From the vantage of an engaged 21st century citizen and educator, frame these academic, intellectual, and practical assets for the benefit of those who are experiencing you now in, in this uh, interview setting. Um, I, when I went to graduate school, I remember my uncle kind of going through the paper and saying, you know, no jobs for poets this week either, Sherry. <laughs> and he, he was right, frankly. Um, but uh, I think that I have such a passion for these topics because rhetoric and composition is about communicating. Mm -hmm. And it's always been important to communicate effectively. But now, I think that given how much text is bombarding us all the time, the texts, the tweets, the stuff on Facebook, all the memos, the emails, that it's even more important to figure out how do you distill your essential message, how do you figure out who your audience is, and how do you reach them. I think that it's reversed even from when I first started teaching because my message was how do you take your thesis, build it out, develop it, but now I'm almost saying, how do you take all of this complexity, all these ideas you have, distill them down and get them to your audience? Mm -hmm. So there's been a big shift there, but I think that's important. I love teaching literature because I really feel that um, life itself is kind of a text. Sometimes we're the protagonist, often we're the antagonist, <laughs> we're engaged in many a conflict, um, we need to figure out how to find patterns and themes in our life. And what I tell my adult learners is, first I want you to develop a passion for reading and understanding literature because I think it's pretty darn fun. But on top of that, I do believe that it helps us um, navigate our own lives better if we can um, read and decode a text. Mm -hmm. so. um, in a previous conversation, you made reference to uh, taking knowledge and you know what where you know you you get knowledge from wherever you get it from you know it's learned from your parents or your you know I don't know pick the source um, but there's a difference between having knowledge and taking action right mm -hmm. can can you say more about how that those two things matter to you mm. So you and I went to Mount Holyoke College, which is a college that really believes in engaging in the world. And I teach at Springfield College, and uh, the college embraces a principle called humanics, and I'm making this shape because its symbol is the triangle for body, mind, and spirit. And I think that those two educational experiences have really taught me that it's not enough just to read a book, learn stuff, and keep it in your brain that ultimately we have an ethical responsibility, that's the spirit part of the triangle with um, Springfield at least, to think about what are we going to do with the privilege we have of having an education and having information, and then how are we, the body piece, going to enact that? How are we going to use it to make the world a better place, to make an impact on it? So I do look at it as a very ethical profession and a calling and that it is my responsibility to help students 
find their responsibility to take and use knowledge in a, in service to others. Mm -hmm. uh, when we speak of knowledge, um, one of the immediate 21st century associations often people make is Google, right? They, they, they are able to go to their computer if they are thinking of, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, telemedicine, you know, let's mm -hmm. just say that they put that search, you know, that, that word in. Um, to what extent do you need to teach your students about refining searches so they get to what they're actually interested in? Right. To me, it's so profound how much access to information we have. I know I said that before and it just continually stuns me when I think about how much we can know, we can gain. But um, yeah, if they do a search like that, they might get 23 million hits, they might get a billion hits. So I think that uh, not only as an English teacher, but any teacher now really has to think a lot about information literacy. We have to help students identify what information do you really need? What are reliable sources where you can find it? How do you assess its credibility? Just because it's there doesn't mean it's right or complete or unbiased. How do you use it and how do you use it ethically? And then how do you cite it so that others can also join the conversation? So I do do a lot of that. Um, and I, we do a lot with the kind of advanced search features on Google um, so that if you're researching you know, schizophrenia or something, you'll know uh, if you're finding something reliable and if you're finding something current. A treatment that might have been reliable in 1920 isn't the same as is going to be reliable now. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> so we right. do a lot of that. And we also, um, I think one thing that's a little deceptive is that people tend to think, well, you know, it, if it exists, it's on Google, right? It's there. And we teach them that, well, maybe, it's probably there, but actually we still have to pay for access to some good information uh, through libraries, research libraries, and so forth. So we teach them how to use Google Scholar to find what kinds of um, scholarly articles are available. But if you access them through there, you, have, you usually have to pay for them, sometimes $30 for an article. So we help them understand that as students, they really have access to all of this scholarly knowledge, not exactly for free, but as part of their tuition, and that once they leave the institution, they can get that stuff maybe through like the Boston Public Library or another good library near them. Mm -hmm. So we try to help them understand the difference between still what scholarly information is, what popular information is. And um, that's, that takes some doing, because we're so used to doing in one click on the phone, oh, I got a billion hits, what more could there possibly be? And a lot of people don't want to even take what seems very easy to us after what we did with manually looking for information to go into the library site, look through the databases the library subscribes to, and get the electronic copies of the journals and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we try to teach them that, that extra 10 or 15 minutes is worth it. <laughs> now, you are a lover of books. I am. Yes. Uh, and you also happen to be a mother of two children. I am. And I'm wondering how, to what extent uh, do you try to um, give your, your children the message, books are important, they have weight for a reason. Um, and part of what I mean by that is, you know, knowledge is powerful, you know, books, if you, you know, open the, you know, that you open them up, they open your mind. So I'm wondering, how do you transfer those values that you have personally to your children? Mm -hmm. well, I think just having a lot of books around uh, has, is important and not everyone can do that. Uh, we always read with the kids at night. We still do, if they let us. And uh, my husband and I both take them to the library a lot. And Margaret actually has kind of read through a lot of the town library at this point. 
<laughs> they, they get several books a week. And so I'm really grateful for that because they're opening their minds in so many ways. But one of my concerns with the digital world is that everything is so quick and fast and animated that I, I do get concerned about the attention span issue. In fact, I don't know if you saw that study that came out that said the attention span now has shrunk to um, slightly shorter than that of a goldfish. It's gone from like 12 seconds to 8 seconds or something along those lines. No, I did not hear that. I'll send you the link. So <laughs> I do get concerned about um, people's ability to read a sustained text and argument and think through it in a world where um, it seems the new skill we need is to be able to rapidly shift. So I think that books are good for helping with the attention span. Speaking of shifting, um, one of your loves is poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, Twitter, when Twitter was first introduced, its 140 character limit was a feature I immediately associated with poetry. Um, put another way, it seemed possible for the medium to become the message. Uh, Twitter has morphed considerably from its start where followers and following are essential to a social media strategist new math toolkit. Uh, so uh, when you think of uh, poetry uh, being uh, taught in, a, in, a, in new ways, I sometimes think that Twitter would be a useful format because there is limited space and poetry to me I think of poetry in that way that the great poets the greatest poets take limited space and say the most with limited space I think that question is incredibly insightful and I think it because I initially felt that um, those kinds of um, formats like Twitter and texting were going to destroy people's ability to compose a sentence, to compose a complex sentence, and I still kind of think that's a danger. But I have really learned that there's a real power in being able to distill a message down to its essence, to what's critical. And I do think poetry does that too. With poetry you have to get rid of anything extraneous. Um, so that it doesn't distract, I think. Uh, the wrong word um, brings in the wrong connotation and it interrupts the tone you're looking for. In Twitter, you use the wrong verb and you can suddenly set off a firestorm. So it can be very good for making you focus really on the denotation, the definition, and the connotation, the kind of uh, emotion around a word. In terms of the the your favorite poets, is there a poet that comes to mind that is very tweetable for you? Um, I have a passion for Elizabeth Bishop. She's one of my favorite poets of all time. You don't need to. You don't need to apologize for that. That's that's a great <laughs> okay, thing. Okay, I'm going to assert that I love Elizabeth Bishop. <laughs> there you go. And she her poems aren't tweetable in their entirety, but uh, there's so many pieces of wisdom in them, and each line is such a beautifully self-contained unit that I think you could, in a very zen-like way, tweet one of her poems over the course of a month and get 30 nuggets of wisdom. Can you give an example? My favorite poem of hers is called One Art. It's about loss and the paradox that we all have to accept loss and learn to deal with it gracefully even though it's the hardest thing. So I think that she would tweet, the art of losing isn't hard to master. And of course it is hard to master, and yet we all must. So I think that that tweet would be like a Zen comb that could get me thinking for right. years. It has actually. <laughs> um. Your association and work with, with Springfield College's School of Human Services places you among a cadre of qualified professors who encourage those returning to school after an absence of academic life to embrace the principles of humanics, community partnership, and academic excellence to achieve social and economic justice. 
that is a tall order for anyone. What methods and practices have you found especially effective as measured by these ambitious goals? And I ask the question, particularly in light of the changes that are taking place uh, you know, among UMass's um, campuses and you know, the future that is being plotted there. Mm. Um, so I spoke a little around humanics earlier, and I'll tell you, because I have the privilege of teaching adult learners who are already out there in the world doing things on their jobs and their families and their communities, especially in human services, they're coming from, I think, such an ethical and powerful place, I feel a real responsibility to connect education with what's happening in their communities and what's uh, and to help them gain skills they need and want to succeed on their jobs which are all about helping humanity so it's very important to me not to leave information as something in a book that you test that doesn't have direct relevance to the real world it's different from vocational training for me it's more ethical and action-based training if they earn a living I'm delighted they deserve to but that isn't my primary goal. It's more about can they be empowered to um, be efficacious in their own lives and in their jobs. So um, that's why I do teach things like let's look at how a connection between analyzing a short story can help you live your life more effectively. Uh, look at your job. Let's talk about conflicts and symbols there and use that as a way to uh, entry point into this story or this text. Mm. Um, I give assignments where uh, I want them to write about things that are relevant uh, um, to themselves. A research paper, I'm not going to assign a topic about Van Gogh or something just because I love it. I'm going to let them choose what's, what they love and what they need to know. Um, I think that education is a privilege and it is a responsibility. So I have a responsibility to them to use their time and energy and money um, in a way that serves them. And then they have a responsibility to take what they've gained, I feel, having had the privilege of going to school and giving it back to others. Final question. <laughs> um, Already? <laughs> <laughs> Innovation is as old as human civilization. Often in our day it is the unquestioned rationale for creating the newest gadget, app, network, or software product. Consider broadly what has innovation delivered in the 21st century that is most promising to you and which innovation of the 21st century is better relegated to the garbage heap. <laughs> Uh, I might repeat myself a bit here because I just cannot emphasize enough how much interconnectivity has brought us in terms of access to knowledge and information. The fact that if a kid in Uganda can get online somewhere for an hour, he can access exactly the same information that I can from a campus in Boston. So the democratization so of it. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I think, though, that, as we were talking about earlier, sometimes that interconnectivity makes people not appreciate what they have right in front of them. It makes it hard for them to connect with their families, with their friends. I think that we get much better at connecting with people far away from us, and that's a privilege and a gift, but the cost seems very often to be the ability to connect with the people who are right here in front of us. Mm -hmm. And even maybe just being active in our own communities. If you can watch TV from Brazil, why are you going to go down the street to go bowling or to help clean up the school? I mean, I think that it gets harder for people to engage in their community because they have to make a really active decision to do it mm -hmm. and cut out other outside stimuli that they can have instead that's easier to get. Thank you for, <laughs> for all of your uh, insights and uh, thoughtful answers. It's a privilege. So let me know when you need part two. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.